Excellent. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, we found as we were spending more time in the national space, going to conferences, we recognized that events weren't really a marketing discipline that was getting a lot of conversation. But yet, as you talked about with that smart asset statistic, and in our experience, they're really strong marketing tools, but nobody is really talking about them. And because Angela and I come from a very in-depth event planning, marketing strategy point of view, we're like, you know, wait a second, somebody needs to be talking about this. And we really think we're those people who should be talking about it. Um, I, I, I know both of you and I agree. You are those people that should be talking about it. Thank um, you. And, and of course, um, we're joined by our friend, Nikki Clark as well. Um, Nikki, we've got similar, you know, similar foundation with, uh, uh, with a certain marketing firm in our background. I have a lot of respect for them though. I'm not going to mention them. Um, but, uh, uh, I've seen you like, I don't know, we've known each other a couple of years. I have seen you flourish in the last year, um, where you kind of fit into this conversation as follow-up from those events, but I know you've got so much knowledge on event uh, hosting, promotion, all the other stuff that um, this is going to be a fun conversation. Talk a little bit about Nikki Clark and Nikki Clark Marketing. I um, have the greatest amount of respect for you. I love what you do. Um, yeah, tell us more about it. Well, first, thank you very much. Um, I, you know, was a big, huge fan geek of you for a long time. And I always rep my <laughs> darling. I love, um, I love it. We need more stickers. <laughs> yes. So um, my name is Nikki Clark, I'm Nikki Clark Marketing. And I do pretty much anything and everything marketing. But when I get on a call with a prospect, I immediately out of the gate tell them the three things I don't do. And one of them is event planning. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that I'm on here. It's just... I did it for five years and that was enough. And so now I, I gladly hand that off to Angela and Elise because that's what they like to do and they're really good at it. Um, but yeah, I was, I did event planning for five years and it was, it was, it's, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. I, Angela and Elise make it look really easy. Um, but there's so much that it takes to pull off a good event conse consecutively and consistently. It's, it's very difficult and challenging. There would be days when I would come home and at the time I was, you know, in an office and I was wearing high heels and you're running around and I come home and it's like midnight, my feet are swollen. I'm carrying the leftover flower bouquets and the leftover wine and I can't <laughs> sleep and lay down and it's just exhausting. But um, as far as what, and we'll, we'll talk about it, but I do have a passion for the follow-up. That's where, that's where I really like to, um, be persistent with with certain individuals and whatnot. And uh, my name is Charlie Van Dervin. For people who I who are here that I don't know already, um, social advisors. We help advisors with a lot of things. Social media. One of those things is LinkedIn events, and so really more digital events. But in the coaching that I do. Um, everybody I coach focuses on small intimate events and so I don't know what Angela and Elise know either on the larger events but I can speak to more of that um, you know getting the right people in a small event and, and the follow-up there so um, listen I think it's a great panel um, you guys thank you again for joining me today um, and uh, we got a wealth of knowledge to bring so um, before we dive in uh, I'm going to stop. Well, I didn't mean to stop share. So sorry about that. We'll get back to that in a second. I meant to go to the next slide. I didn't mean to stop share. So, um, so we're going to talk okay, about okay. four things. And then uh, after this slide, then I'm going to stop share so you can see us in full screen. But what we want to talk about, we figured really a, a nice a nice discussion would be around number one, why events matter for advisors, right? Like let's 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 lay it out there. Um, the smart asset stat that I was talking about that that was kind of before the start here was 25% of advisors in 2023. Uh, this is according to a smart asset survey uh, said that uh, events were their number one marketing focus for the year. Um, why is that? Why, you know, we all agreed that that number should be higher. Um, mm. But, but why is why are events so important for advisors uh, Two, choosing the right event? Um, so important. Number three, and maybe the most important is who to bring to that event. 
I don't think I'd say most important. Actually, I'd say most important for number four, right? You can pull off a great event and everybody can have a really good time, but how do you turn that into business, right? What's the follow-up component uh, to that event that's going to that's gonna help convert attendees and, and people you've built some rapport with into, into new clients, right? So um, cool. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Now, you know, just uh, the, the housekeeping stuff, of course, um, we'll all kind of be monitoring this. So if you got questions for us, drop it in the chat. Uh, our Q&A is fine also. And uh, we're going to just kind of take some turns batting some questions around. But Angela, why don't we start with you? Because you're in the Brady Bunch square that I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of top left there, right? So I don't know okay. whose position that was back in the day. Um, but let's talk about that. Uh, how how do events, um, going back to that smart asset survey, mm -hmm. um, there's lots of things that, that advisors can be doing and should be doing for marketing. How do events fit in? And why are they, in some cases, superior to other marketing that, that advisors can be doing? Well, if we want to look at your marketing like a stream, you want to have all your different marketing tools, we'll refer to them as rocks in the stream. And events need to be one of those pieces. And none of your marketing pieces really should be standing alone. They should be working together. So if you think of a stream, all those rocks work to up the water flow down the stream and work together. The reason events are so important um, is they bridge the gap between your, the advisor or wholesaler or broker dealer, whomever you are doing the event, they, they bring that personal interaction where a lot of our communications and a lot of our marketing don't have that one-on-one, -on -one, face to face Zoom-to-Zoom -zoom personal interaction. And that's so important these days. And they foster the connections, which build the relationships. Yeah. Oh, and when you build those relationships, you build the no like trust. Yeah, I love it. And we're going to talk about trust transfer at some point here, I'm sure, right? That's such an important piece of it. Elise, um, let's talk about how events impact brands, right? So an advisor's brand is enhanced by event marketing. Um, how, what, do you, what does that mean? How does an event enhance an advisor's brand personally or, you know, or the firm brand? I, I feel like it's a... Um show me, not tell me sort of model. Events allow you to show. We can talk about the brand. We can talk about what the colors mean and what we're trying to convey. But when you actually get people together in a space, that's sort of that opportunity for you to, to show. What, what are we saying when we say we're a caring brand, right? Or what does that mean when we're... Um, we really believe in education. Like we can say it, but events give the opportunity to actually show it, build that connection. Um, and again, everyone keeps saying it's that big lead up of how we use all that in the follow-up to continue the conversation um, once we leave the room, as I like to say. Yeah. Can I interject and just add, it's yeah. also that experience, right, Elise? Like that feeling especially women, like, how do you feel? <laughs> well, about again, it's, you're right. It's, it's showing, right. Um, one of the things that we're big proponents of is the, what we call positive emotional memory. It's a very psychology driven, but when you do an event, hopefully, and we can talk about this because Nikki and I kind of bantered about this on, in social media about if there's such a thing as a ho-hum event, um, when you're creating a positive emotional memory, how are you going to put that in a bottle and, and carry it with you? And that's, there's lots of ways to do that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Nikki, you've done a lot of event planning in the past. I know it's something you're not doing for your advisor clients right now. Um, in the, in the event work that you've done in the past, how do you see events strengthening that bond between advisor and client? Oh yeah, well, we, you can put on a, a very large event, but you can still make it feel intimate. And one of the things that we would always implement would be a dinner afterwards that for a select group of people, and those became very coveted. So people would join the wait list to join the next dinner. Um, so, 
I'm so sorry, Charlie. I got sidetracked on something. What was the question? How does it stre strengthen your <laughs> For those butt? who are here, I just had a baby, and that yeah. was like total. <laughs> we, we, we should, brain. Should, yeah, we should have qualified. So we don't have that excuse, at least. So we, uh, we have to be on it. <laughs> Yeah, I just have old age. By Nikki. <laughs> About an event for building that bond between it. The bond, yeah. 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 And so it does, it does matter. Um, we, you know, went through a lot of different experiences where, you know, we could get a lot of people that came, but if you're not interacting with those people and if you're not doing the follow-up, they're not going to come again. And so um, we'll get into the follow-up later, but the bond is what gets them coming back and is what gets them bringing guests. And any any way you can find to make that more intimate is going to be impactful. One one of the strategies strategies that we implemented was the dinner, and it was a very nice day. I never even got to go to one, and I hosted them. So <laughs> that must have been nice. Um, that that brings up an interesting point, right? Where I I mentioned in the uh, in the opening that a lot of the coaching, you know, a lot of the coaching relationships we implement on an intimate event, uh, you know, eight or ten or twelve people max. Um, half clients, half prospects, if we can. Um, now, Angela and Elise, you guys plan much larger events than that, right? So there's an, how do you, how do you capture? I don't even think this was on our list of questions I sent you guys. So here we go off the cuff, right? <laughs> but how do you, if you're doing a bigger event, how do you capture an intimate feeling so that you can take, you know, so you can hit on some of that, that PEM I wrote down, but it was positive, emotional, whatever it was. Elise. Memory. Memory, it's thank memory, you. memory, Charlie, memory. <laughs> <laughs> Be my ginkgo galoob, ginkgo biloba. Um, so how do you take a large event that is designed maybe as a client appreciation event maybe there's 100 people there and make that feel intimate for uh for each individual i think angela can speak to that as she has done that um really well with a lot of her advisor and our advisor clients but i the, the one thing i feel like we're not really talking about that I want to kind of throw in here yeah. is we're talking about intimate events. We're talking about larger events. We're talking about client appreciation. We're talking about prospecting. Um, one of the philosophies that we have that we feel very strongly about is putting on events that your clients, if it's a client recognition or your prospects, just by surveying, putting on events that they want, not necessarily events that you think they want and people are like, Ooh, whoa, that's kind of like mind readery. But um, again, our philosophy of this event, a moment that you create, and we have this concept of the return on the moment, which is like a wheel. When you're doing your follow-up, you're gathering information for the next time that you're doing the event. So for example, um, some clients are like, I want a really large event. Some clients are like, I really want a small, intimate event. Um, we recommend people do a mix that they don't just kind of go into one wheelhouse. Um, but I think Angela, so that's just sort of a little side note to that, but it's doing what your clients want to do, not what, sorry, Charlie, not what your coach tells you to do, what you think, because let's face it, even though we may be advisors and wholesalers, we're all marketers at heart, right? Sure. Everybody's a marketer. Um, it's not about you. It's about the client, the potential client. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Angela, carry on. <laughs> so we like to really advise, when we plan the events and we advise the implementers that are planning their events, put your attendee hat on and start from the very beginning, developing that experience for them, even if it's a larger event. So the process is the same, whether it's a small dinner, it's an educational event, it's a larger event, you know, start with the invitation, um, have people on your team call the invitees. Um, if they have an RSVP, you know, give that personal invitation, call them. Then when you get close to the event, make sure you communicate about parking and attire, you know, uh, you can do this by a phone call as well. And then the day of the event, again, whether it's a small event or a larger event, you have people on your team at really every juncture that the attendee is going to be um, crossing through. So when they enter the restaurant or the venue, somebody's there or there's signage greeting them. Um, it's very important that you have all of your team members uh, have roles. So you have somebody at the you know, 
check-in. You have somebody that's wandering around, milling around by the bar. And you have people, um, if you have a seated dinner or a seated event, you, you stagger your team. You have somebody at each table. And by having those interactions, you're, you're making them feel special. You're making them feel like they're the, you know, one of the only ones there. Um, they're not walking in feeling lost, not knowing where to go, not knowing where to sit, not, you know, a lot of these events, um, they just know the people they came with, um, their spouse. They don't really know a lot of people in the um, advisor community. So it's introducing people. It's really making them feel welcome and, and all those little touch points to build the relationships. And what you're doing is making them feel comfortable. They're liking you, they're knowing you, they're knowing the community, and they're trusting you. And they leave with a very um, positive memory from that moment. Um, and again, that. all the way through um, the event to the yeah. time they leave. Thank you so much. Um, we look forward to seeing you again, or if they have an appointment already on, on the calendar, you know, you just make those, those personal interactions. Yeah, super, super high touch. Yeah, I love and when, that. One thing also too, with teams, we like to have a pre-team huddle uh, and see who's coming and make note of anything that you know about them. Did they just have a baby? Did they just have a grandchild? Did they just go on a trip? And bring those, you know, those you know, topics into conversation. And on the other side of that, when you are, when the team members are having conversations and a client or attendee mentions something, um, which we like to call wow moments. You know, did they just have a baby or a grandbaby or go on a trip? You you make a mental note, write it down in your phone, um, you know, quickly, just so you don't forget. And those pieces that you um, have in the conversation, you bring those back up. Um, and maybe there was a family moment that you didn't know about and a gift shows up, you know, a couple of weeks later, recognizing that event. So yeah. really put your attending hat on and how would you like to feel when you walk, to, walk into a event? I love that. I, I really like the high touch approach. And um, I would call that maybe in, in, in you know, a, a surprise and delight type gift afterwards. That's pretty cool mm -hmm. stuff. Um, at least you brought it up. So I'm going to throw this back to you. Uh, there's all kinds of varieties of events, right? Not just yep. what your coach tells you to do. Uh, incidentally, we tried to do get personal in those. Um, but, uh, so, so that being said, how do I know what to do as an advisor? Right. I mean, my coach is telling me to do these small 10 person events. I've got, you know, uh, others telling me that I need to do a large client appreciation event once or twice a year. Some people tell me I need to get the, you know, buy the, buy the tent at the PGA event that's coming through our town. Um, how do I know to, what to do, right? I mean, how do I, how do I put that into action, make a decision there? I'm a big goal and objective person. So I would say, work it backwards. Like, what, do you, what are you trying to do, right? Are you trying to prospect? Are you trying to connect with your top clients deeper to turn them into potential referral sources? Um, are you simply saying, I'm really appreciative of your business. Thank you. Like that can be enough. Um, so really understanding what the, the goal is. And again, it just comes to this very, in my opinion, very simple ask. So when you're doing client reviews or if you're doing follow-ups, if you're already doing events in your follow-ups, um, talk about if we were going to do, these are three topics that we're thinking about, how that. would you rank them? Um, I do recommend being very specific in those questions, because if you say to someone, you know, do you, how was lunch, right? Uh -huh. It was fine. But how was the turkey sandwich that you had at lunch? Like you can get a little more specific and get much better information than asking very broad questions. So using those other touch points to gain information that then you can look at through a CRM or wherever you store that information and say, aha, th this is, this is what my people or my kind of people, we get into the whole ideal client conversation. Um, that's what they like. That's what they want. That's what I'm going to try to do. Um, good segue, Elise. Thank you. 
Um, Nikki, you and I have had countless conversations about niche marketing. What can we do? Like, how do we, how do we take what we know who we serve, right? As, as far as a niche and, and build a, build an event around that particular, you know, sub-segment of a population. Yeah. Um, it's really important to know those, let me think, niches. Riches in the niches. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow. I, I what, riches yeah, I riches it in the niches. It just sounds so bougie. Cheryl Hickerson <laughs> is here. And last time I, I said it, she was like, you're wrong. It's niche. I know. No, I'm just making <laughs> 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 <There you go. laughs> no, But it's on text. So how is she actually pronouncing it? Exactly. How is she writing it? Right. Good point. <laughs> Good point. She's going to jump on here in a second. <laughs> I know she is. Um, um, but it is important to know those specific little pockets because you can have the large events, but then you can have the smaller ones. And so I was in Dallas and Dallas, Dallas is just known for a lot of stuff, but country clubs and golf courses. And so we would have a lot. We did have tents at the PGA tour and the Byron Nelson, and I was in charge of those too. Um, but you know, if, if it was a women, if it was a woman's event, we didn't, we didn't do the typical, everything needs to be pink and it's flowers and tea, right? We knew our women and what they liked. We had a lot, a lot who were loved golf as well. So we made sure I was a huge proponent of it. Um, when we are inviting the men to this event, we, I don't care if they're married or not, the woman gets her own, the woman of the house gets her own invite as well, because, um, you have to appeal to her too, because she's, she, let's, she's pulling the strings behind the scenes. So that's, what's really going on. Um, but this is where your CRM comes in incredibly handy. So where you, so I was in charge of the CRM too, and this is where tags can come in really handy and knowing likes and dislikes. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to invite someone to a wine tasting event. This happened before to a wine tasting event that we were, um, using a competitor's wine and we invited, yeah, we invited someone who they were both competitors, right? <laughs> so that, that was a huge, and we had to do a huge, like, whoopsie, we're so sorry. And we'll use your product in the next marketing event. So you're going to need to, to, to actually use your CRM, like putting notes in there isn't going to be helpful unless you're using it. And like Elise said, ask, like, what type of events would you like to attend? What would you like to see in the future? Do you have any friends you would like to bring? And you can make events out of those. Yeah. Um, but those small events are the big events, the client appreciation once a year or the anniversary event or whatnot. Those small events, though, those are where it's at. I agree. I, I, I completely agree. And one of the things that, that we do is we've got a checklist, right? So it is a, it's, a, it's a white sheet and it's got maybe a dozen different types of events that the advisor's thinking of doing in the coming year. So in a review meeting, you can actually say, yeah. hey, we're thinking about doing some events in the year. Are any of these, do any of these align with, uh, with things you'd like to do, right? So um, I, find, I find that's effective. Uh, yeah, well, just asking, like, yeah, just ask. Right. Yeah, it's, exactly. You'll be amazed. Yeah, yeah. Angela, so, why don't you talk a little bit about that women advisory? concept because i think that Saw that my wheels turning <laughs> yeah i can read your mind some business partners <laughs> That's scary. Uh -oh. those are good partners yeah oh geez so it really goes back to what we were talking about is asking asking your clients what kind of events they want to attend and that can be done in review meetings it can be done at the event but one thing that um we've seen really have really good success is when an advisor firm has a client advisory board and these are clients that you've hand selected, and it could even be COIs to be part of the board where you value their opinion. They are pretty much your ideal client and you run um, these questions by them. And a spin off of that, which is what Elise was alluding to, is you can segment your advisory boards. Specifically, you can have a women's advisory board if you're looking to deepen your relationships with the women clients of your firm, or maybe it's young professionals or retirees, but you segment and have an advisory board of such. For one advisor that um, I've worked with for quite a while, we did just that. We hosted a brunch and it was just a brunch to for the women of the firm to get to know them and let them know we were looking to develop a women's advisory board. And we had flip charts and we asked, what, what would you like to see? If we were to create events 
specifically for you, what would you like to do? And we had pages and pages and they wanted to go to the movies. They wanted a garden. They wanted finance 101. They wanted to learn about new products. They wanted to develop a community. And fast forward, you take that information, uh, what type of events they want, what time of day they want the events, when they want the events, um, and you create it around what they want. And it, it really makes them feel heard and, and they come and they bring friends. So. Um, let's, let's talk about some, some innovative formats for events. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's some that educational events, of course, seminars, people, you know, people put on a lot of seminars, right? Um, the wholesalers like those, I think, because it gives mm -hmm. them an opportunity then to talk about product. Um, are there other outside of that seminar educational event? We talked a little bit about PGA tents and things along those lines. What kind of innovative formats have you guys experienced um, in working with advisor clients that have been really successful? I would love to share this real quick. Yeah. In Dallas, we had a gentleman. Um, he, I never met him. He uh, was a collector of historic motorcycles. Cool. So he had a museum there. He didn't want anyone to know him. He it was it was strictly so he could show his collection, but share his passion. But he wanted to fly under the radar, so I never got to meet him. But I hosted an event there, and you would not believe. I mean, there was an evil Knievel bike there. It was so cool, and we had hors d'oeuvres because it it's a very nice. There's not a place to have like a big dinner, and we had wine and and um someone to walk around and explain the, the motorcycles. I had more women show up than men. So it was, it's just fun. You can think outside the box. You don't always have to do an event at a country club. So that's just my two cents right there. Yeah. I'm going to pitch in on that um, because for those of you who I haven't met, I don't actually come from the financial advisor background. I come from the sports and entertainment and even higher education event world. Um, so if you want to talk about PGA and tournaments and all that sort of stuff, not only can I help you get that high return on the moment of those, but I can pull the curtain back because I've sold them. So I know what that's all about. But when you're talking about your motorcycle um, thing, so I have two sons and um, our second son is very into cars. And when he was bar mitzvahed, we held his reception at a place called the World of Speed in Portland, Oregon, which is no longer open um, but it was the same vein. It was like this guy had collected these interesting cars. So he bought, rented like a warehouse and turned it into a museum. Um, I had people like the photographer, parents who have other children who are being bar and bought mitzvah saying, this was the best party I've ever been to because it was about the kid and it was about the interest. So, you know, Cheryl puts it in here too in the, in the text, but whether we do it for a bar mitzvah or for a client party, um, it's about experience. It's again, it's creating that positive emotional memory. Like what's something unique that is gonna make that experience stick out in a positive way and a way that resonates with that person who's there. Um, another example, I was talking to an advisor and they talked about having the box at the local AHL hockey arena. And what do I do? How, how do I, like, I'm tired of inviting the same people or I'm tired of like cycling through. Um, so some of the tips, again, being able to pull the curtain back was like, can you get the mascot to show up, right? Who doesn't love a mascot? Who doesn't love having their picture taken with the mascot? Who doesn't love getting the mascot picture texted to them that they can then share on social media because they were at this event with their financial advisor. Um, the other angle with that too, in that experience is, um, can you do a behind the scenes sort of thing? Like again, this hockey thing, a, a parent child skating session after a game, cool. like just kind of leaning into that. But again, I go back to the, who's your client, right? So would people be like, no, I don't, I don't like ice skating. Okay, fine. Like it'd still be kind of cool. You can like, there's a very unique smell of being on a hockey bench. Um, trust me. Uh, <laughs> Laura can People won't, for, you won't forget it. Um, 
but how can you kind of create these experiences that resonate with that client that you want to replicate? I love it. I love it. I have it. some ideas too. Lots of ideas. Um, Angela, yeah. Lots of ideas. Uh, and and you don't, I, I can hear the um, attendees on this webinar going, oh my gosh, I have to get a box or I have to get, you know, you know something large or I have to, you know, really be over the top and you don't. Yeah. Um, for example, I'm we're doing a, a client appreciation dinner um, this week for an advisory board and it's the small touches. So going into a restaurant is one thing, but asking the restaurant to really create that experience. So we have a private little room to greet everybody and do a toast and appetizers. And then we're moving to the chef's table, which is something that isn't readily available. And then on top of that, the owner is coming in who is um, uh, award-winning sommelier and doing the, a wine pairing um, for during that dinner experience. Um, we've made arrangements for the chef to come out and say a few words. And then the restaurant and the owners actually bottle their own wine. So we've made arrangements for each guest to receive a bottle of their handmade wine uh, signed. So just the Very little cool. touches. So um, yes, you can get a box at the hockey rink. You can um, you know, bring in an entertainer, but it doesn't have to be that grandiose for every single event. Yeah. And Charlie, you had asked them for some innovative um, ideas. One idea that has been successful that we've seen is a legacy planning event where you get people together and you can have a speaker, but there's some books out there that you can purchase for your attendees and they start writing, you know, things that they want to share with their children or their beneficiaries, love letters, um, you know, different types of events that, that really are emotional um, tight events. And that brings together the um, emotional memory, the experience, builds no life trust, you've created this, um, you know, experience yeah. for them. Those are awesome, all awesome ideas. We've got one client who does whiskey and chocolate pairing yep. with, <laughs> with, with Norman Love, uh, you know, like a world renowned chocolatier. And, you know, anyway, so very cool. Now, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, you guys, I promise you that I'd kind of move us along and keep us I, I, I know we want to get to follow up and we've got that fourth in our line so there's a little bit to talk about before that but I think we all agree that follow-up is so key so um, we'll get there in a moment but first before we do that let's talk about how do we get the right people there right so <clears throat> excuse me client appreciation seems like it's a little more simple to get the right people there but if this is a prospecting event um, you know, bring a friend only goes so far, right? How do we make sure that we fill the room with the right people that, that we want to meet? And then the all important trust transfer, right? When we've got a happy client that introduces us to their friend, that trust transfers immediately shortening those sales cycles. Any, any tips? Um, Nikki, we'll start with you because, uh, you haven't spoken a little bit, so we'll let you warm up your vocal cords before we get to follow up. Um, how do we get the right people in the room? Um, to me, this was just always a challenge. I'll, I'll be honest, um, because we would ask, you know, do you have a friend that would be interested in this? And you wouldn't just want to randomly reach out to that friend, like, who are you coming in here? I already have an advisor, leave me alone type of thing. And uh, so we would just ask some of our clients, you know, if if you have someone else who would be interested in this, we have a free ticket or we will reserve a spot for them or let us know what their favorite thing to drink is and we'll have that ready. Um, we we would wanna make sure it wasn't in, intrusive at all, that we would want our client to ask that person to join and come and not when they get there, not bombard them at the door or, or anything like that because it, it can come off really wrong. I think for me personally, it was a very delicate line. Um, yeah. I was the first line of defense, I guess, you can say as far as reaching out to people. And so we did it very carefully because um, let's be real, at the end of the day, we're wanting their business, right? So how can you do it the most genuine way? And um, it's tough, Char Charlie. I We would just say, is there anyone that you think would be interested in this? Feel free to invite them. Uh, and that that's how we did did it. 
We, we, uh, we spend a lot of time sourcing names and really taking, taking time to deep dive into how your best client, your advocates, we'll call it, right? A list of advocates. How are your best advocate clients connected to people through uh, their neighborhood, through their job, through who do they socialize with, um, you know, faith, what faith organizations, right? And so I think as, as they're advocate clients for a reason, because maybe they've made referrals or they made introductions in the past. Uh, and so just by, by sourcing names in time, you start to build a database of so people you can say, hey, we're doing this event. You mentioned that you, you know, you hang out with your friend, Jim, bring Jim, you know me, we're not, it's not a sales event. I just want a chance to meet him, bring Jim, right? So being specific about who we want to be introduced to has been effective. Um, but that takes intelligence. You got to gather intelligence ahead of time, right? So not smarts. Just gathering. <laughs> That's what I was like. <laughs> yeah, I saw. I saw your reaction, Elise, for sure. You guys, any 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 tips, Elise, Angela, on how how to fill that room full of uh, full of the right people? Angela, I'm going to defer to you. Yeah, I got a couple um, other ideas too. It it really goes down to what boils down to what you said, Charlie. Is um, and, and Nikki, you don't want to be like, okay, who do you know? Um, yeah. yeah, I'm going to jump on him as Make soon as you, yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it's, you want to be welcoming. Um, I love your ideas, Nikki, you know, we have an extra ticket. Um, we have some extra space. If you'd like to bring a friend and then when that friend comes, not, okay, what's your name and your info and when's a good time to talk to you? And do you want to come into the office? You know, just be very low key. It's so nice to meet you. Glad you could join us. If you have any questions, let us know. And then also not going right in. Um, at the end, going so so, can we meet? Um, just be very cool. And then the more you think of the no, like, and the trust, and put your attendee hat on. You're going to an event with a friend. You're like, am I going to get sold? What are they going to do? I feel kind of uncomfortable. Just make it very um, um, casual. Put your attendee hat on. So as far as filling the room um, with prospects, it goes back to identifying your ideal client so that you can clone them per se. You know, where do they hang out? Where do they um, read their information? Are they on, what social media channels are they on? What, um, do they receive email? And, and, and target the people you want to based on the knowledge of the client, your ideal client. Yeah, I love that. And they that. will I, come. I, I, would, I would say also, um, if someone has said, and we've all experienced this, right? Hey, I sent my friend Susie to see you, but Susie never calls, <clears throat> right? If that's an advocate client that you're basing an event around, remember Susie's name because that's the person you might want to invite to bring them to the, to the event as obviously they have a need or that referral wouldn't have been happening. So anyway, so. Um, can I, 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 can I have can I one more thing there? Get in really there at least Again, sure. yeah. coming at it from just a different viewpoint. We talk about having goals for events. I'm probably going to get myself in a lot of trouble when I say this. <laughs> I really don't believe that an event goal, the measurement of success should be, I spent X and I made Y, or I did this and therefore I got this many new clients because it's not how people make decisions, right? It's, it's I've made a connection. I want to make a connection with, five new people through this event. But think about it again, like Angela was saying, it's a little bit about that stream, but this time it's like an information stream. Clients come to you when they are ready. If they've had some sort of transition, if they are facing a transition, if they've gotten an inheritance, like whatever the thing is, your job is to be the top of mind when they're ready to make a move. You cannot make them make a move. That's it. Yep. Yeah. That's it's, where marketing comes in too. Just saying. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, absolutely. But event is events are marketing, right? So it's, yep. it's a touch point. Um, I'm going to hand it to you, Charlie. It's a touch point to create this follow-up, which is again, the rest of the stream. So it's not only just the follow-up of the event, but follow-up of the building of the relationship so that when people are ready, you're the one they're coming to. Yeah, I love it. And that's just that's that's presence being there, right? Um, which I think is a good a good jump right into follow up. And I I think we all agree, right? Like the most important part of doing an event 
is following up from the event. I mean, this is this is where the hay is made. If probably there's a better way to say that, but Nikki, I'm going to defer, man. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to let you lead this off. What talk about some of, you know, some of the uh, some of the really important things to do to prepare for follow up and then methodology for follow up. Yeah. So this is where I would spend at least a good three days after an event, and I was just dissecting all the data possible. But the follow up, I made it a point either myself or the advisor or the advisor's assistant would reach out within 24 to 48 hours. Like it had to get done period. And I would follow up with them to see if they followed up with the attendees because we don't, I don't want anyone to fall through the cracks. And um, those follow-ups could be an email. It could be a phone call. Um, I preferred phone calls and just leave a message. And then um, some people just felt more comfortable with an email and that's fine. Um, and and we, I would keep all of that data also. And because over time you would see, oh, this person's consistently showing up now and they then they brought a friend. Um, but it's it's that wrapping up of a feeling, like it's those feelings that you get um, after an event. I mean, just think about it yourself. If you have attended an event that you've been invited to and then you get a follow-up, like a thank you for attending. And that's it, no selling at all. Like you wanna get some coffee later, nothing like that. Just thank you for attending. It was a pleasure. And that's it. Um, that goes a long way. And we also implemented something every Friday, uh, once a month to write handwritten letters to people who attended events. And so each um, person, I would I would goal them to do it five, five, but you know, people don't know how to write letters anymore, it seems like. <laughs> um, but that was really important also. And there's also a goal in, in the follow-up, like what, what was the goal of the, the event, but what's the goal of your follow-up also, you need to be ready, ready for that. Um, and one thing I did want to mention real quick is when we would send out the invites, sometimes I would get a phone call or sometimes I would get an email and the person letting me know that they couldn't attend. And I'd be like, no problem whatsoever. Thank you for letting me know. FYI, here's our next upcoming events. And if there's anything that you would like, us to do in the future, please let us know. And I'll tell you, that was a huge success. So I would really um, encourage people, if someone does reach out and say that they can't attend scheduling conflict or what, whatever, or it's too far or not interested, just thank them for that response because that takes time to do. And then ask how they, what kind of events they would like in the future and what type of topics. Um, that's where we got some of our best ones. And also topics... I'm going off a little off course here, but real quick, they don't all have to be about finance. One of our best uh, events, and these were historically boring events, was we had someone from the Brain Institute. That was, we had a 76% show rate. Normally we had a, a 35. So, um, but as far as the, the follow-ups also, with the right type of event and right people, send a survey. Uh, we did one at a women's event. I was not a fan of this woman's event. Um, I don't think every woman likes clothes. And so I thought it was a little presumptuous, <laughs> but they held it at a fancy um, Neiman Marcus. And it was a spring clothing line, whatnot. And then uh, we sent the follow-up and one of our top clients was like, this was nice, but what was it about? She had no idea what it was about. She felt like she was being used because of her connections to other people. And she felt it completely missed the mark. So you can get a lot of good intel on those follow-ups also. And it is also really important for it to be personalized. Um, I know some people might have 150 people come to this event. This is really important. So if you really do care about growing your business, personalize those follow-ups. Um, a templated email just isn't going to work. Um, it, if you really do care about these and you are passionate about it, then then you'll find a way to make that happen. You can even hire someone to do that. I mean, granted, I was doing that for my company, but you can hire someone to do that. And it's not that expensive. Um, and then also for the CRM, that's going to be your best source. I, I lived for my CRM because I was able to go in there. Like Angela said, this person just bought a house. This person just had a baby. We would send them like a baby blanket with the name inscribed on it. Um, 
or if we knew that they liked a certain wine, we would have it delivered to their house or whatnot. So all of those CRM notes are going to be monumental. They're just going to help you for your next event. Uh, that's so much great feedback. Um, okay. And Elise, yeah, jump in. May I add something? Um, when people think about follow-up, you see a timeline in your head, right? And that comes at the end, right? It's happened after the, the moment. But what we recommend is instead of putting follow-up at the end, build that into your marketing plan so that you know what you're planning on doing in that follow-up so you can capture whatever it is that you need to make that a success. What I mean by that is um, I'll do a presentation and I'll reference one of my favorite books. It's called The Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath. Well, you know what? There you go. I see Charlie writing it down. That's <laughs> going to go in the follow-up that's going to go out to people say, that, and that book that Elise was talking about in her presentation, here's a link to it where you can get it on Amazon. Yeah. But you need to kind of know that. Um, you know, pictures are always great to, to be able to put in follow-up, but you can't take them once everybody's left. Um, just kind of thinking about what your follow-up is going to look like um, so that you're ready to take action and that you have the information or the collateral, if you will, to be able to do it. And have that time scheduled in because oh, absolutely, I made that one mistake. I forgot and then I created a playbook afterwards and I just made that one mistake and I was like oh this takes a while you plan that in book that into your schedule and then real quick can I answer Patty's question yeah, about the be. CRM data and capture and where do you hold it depends on the CRM Patty yeah. of where you capture it how you capture it where you hold it and also I worked on the CRM juncture I think it was called um it was so dated. It was awful. <laughs> and so, no, it was not dynamic. And so for the kids, I would put their, but I would put their birth year, year. also mm -hmm. because yeah. um, that was important also. We would send, you know, if they were turning 16, we would send something to do with driving or college or whatnot. So you have to know what your CRM is capable of. Most of them, even now, aren't capable of being dynamic. So, but it's important to to um, a lot time to make sure you're managing your CRM. Yeah, that's important. That's that's important. I don't. I think most advisors. I'm guessing when I say that most, uh, more than fifty percent of advisors probably use their CRM. Again, I'm throwing out some numbers that I'm guessing at, but not very well, right? To not very well at all. I spent three weeks <clears throat> um, combing out ours, and that was just three solid weeks. Mm -hmm. And then it all went downhill again. <laughs> yeah, you don't keep up with it, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and think about exactly what it is. You know, we, we throw around the acronym. It's a customer relationship management tool. So it's not just, I have their name, their address, their email, their cell phone. I might have their pet's name. I might have their kids' birthdays in there. I might know what their favorite wine is. I might know what country club what season, like whatever the things are, um, you should be able to build all of that stuff in. And um, that gets to a whole different conversation about CRM management right. and what you should be looking for in one, but having that flexibility for a notes space and being consistent in what you put mm -hmm. in there is going to be super helpful. And right. check those notes. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> even as basic as having food allergies and we do that all the time is once somebody tells you they're a vegetarian or have an allergy you don't keep going back or worse you don't serve them something they can't have when they have mentioned it before I mean, it's a huge um a huge thing and I always get um, oh my gosh thank you so much for remembering this is great you know um, exactly. one attendee that always shows up and she's a vegetarian she goes oh my gosh I feel so special um, I have a couple of tactics for on the follow-up to add to what Nikki said is in this day and age, uh, video, a quick bomb bomb, you know, thank you for coming, uh, really goes a long ways. Yes, it takes time, but if you build that into your planning, then you'll have the time when you get back into the, into the office. And also really um, uh, overthinking and emphasizing somebody that brought a guest, whether it's a handwritten note, 
um, and that guest as well. But if somebody took the time to bring somebody, it, it's a bit vulnerable to bring somebody, you know, hoping that they have a great experience thanking them for bringing them in a bomb bomb and or a handwritten note. Yeah, you're, you're asking people to take time out of their day to come and to put their neck out and bring someone. Um, I don't know about you, but I really love when people cancel plans on me because then I can stay home. So like, <laughs> it takes a lot for some people to get out, you know, and um, for them to, if it's a in-person event for them to take the time out to do that or a webinar, like for everyone took the time to watch this today, like, thank you. That's a Absolutely. big deal. Yeah. That's huge. I, a couple, a couple of thoughts on uh, commentary. So um, we keep talking about, it takes time to follow up along those lines. Nikki, you said earlier, 150 people, you want to write a handwritten note. Maybe my thought is your event is probably better at that 75 person range if you don't have the time to follow up with 150 people, right? So I'd, I'd almost prefer quality over quantity in that regard, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then we were talking about CRMs. Reality is, you guys, there are more than 750 CRM technologies on the market right now. I mean, it's crazy. I don't know what, you know, what source code makes it easy to build a CRM, but there's a lot of them out there. Um, I think where people get, you know, and, and the industry's got some great ones. Right. The industry's got, you know, with Wealthbox and Redtail and there's others out there. I think a lot of people confuse like marketing automation platforms like Active Campaign as a CRM. It's not. Yeah. Right. That's not built for your client relationship. That's built for marketing automation. Now there's, we, we have a platform called High Level, which, you know, we're a reseller of lots of lots of people are that have both you know, high uh, automation and CRM, but it's not an, in, it's not an industry product. It's strictly a prospecting product. So they're all not, they're not all built the same. I've used Junkster before. I'm sorry. You had to go through that experience. <laughs> it know. was brutal. Yeah. Yeah. And out, outside the industry keeps a great one. I like keep. Um, we really like high level as a, as a reseller of it. There's a reason we resell it. Salesforce is obviously top of the heap. Um, HubSpot, now, Salesforce with Pardo and HubSpot are great technologies, but they're also very expensive. And they also have their flaws. I dealt with the, sure. both of those. And if it's if it's just not worth it, it's not worth it. There's yeah. never going to be a perfect one. Mm -mm. Um, because no. again, coming from a different industry, you know, what, what your season ticket database has, um, there's always going to be something, hopefully, that you do a little differently than everybody else. Um, and... Is there flexibility in the, the back end? Maybe, maybe not. And you just have to figure that out. So it's not, um, there, you're never going to find the perfect one because it doesn't exist. Most importantly is what you put in, garbage in, garbage out. That's so it. it's yep. really important to. Yep. Got to be consistent. Um, Interesting. We, less, sorry, Cheryl just posted, we love less annoying CRM. Yeah, yeah I know. I, know. <laughs> okay, I just that. like their name, really. Yeah. That's a brilliant marketing name. <laughs> love that. Thanks, I Cheryl. would say one, one of the issues for a large, for a large company is we, this is way back. I don't even know what year, but we were implementing Microsoft dynamics into a, a large firm of about 200 people. And you would teach the sales team. We, it was a vendor to the industry. You teach the sales team how to use a CRM and then you go through every department and you'd have to come back to the sales team. The people who need it the most um, use it the worst, right? As, yeah. far as, as far as data entry is concerned. And I mean, it really, oh, yeah. Ongoing, yeah. Greg says Wealthbox. Wealthbox is great. Uh, lots of lots of email plugins, um, and it's built for the industry, right? So if you're keeping client data in there, it's uh, that's that's good. Redtail's good. So um, you guys were kind of bumping up against it. I love this discussion. Thank you for doing this with me. I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. First thing I want to make sure we do before before we close down is if you would enter your best contact information in the chat box so people can grab that. Um, Maybe drive to the website. Look at Nikki so on top of it. She's, got a link <laughs> She's been waiting to hit send. That was, that was right there. <laughs> I will. Uh, I'm just going to put LinkedIn in there. Are you putting ours in, Elise? No, I was waiting for you to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you you were looking down, so I didn't want to. I was reading twice. Nikki's. <laughs> I will do it. I've actually got to go to my LinkedIn to get it. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I usually yeah. do that too. That's going to take a second. <laughs> yeah. So like we were saying at the top of the hour, um, we have recently rebranded. So event advisors, um, Angela's going to put it into the chat, but 
Our email is hello at event-advisors.net. Um, and we are on LinkedIn, both individually and corporately. Um, and I'm so gonna give one shout out here. And then I'm so sorry, guys, but I have a child I have to go pick. Yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> multitasking cow. entrepreneur. Um, but I do wanna say for everyone that's on here, um, I wholeheartedly believe in Angela and Elise. So if you do need help with your event planning, don't come to me. Uh, please go to them. I will always, always refer to them. They know what they're doing um, and they're, they're really good at it. So um, with that, I'm so sorry, you guys, but I do have a child. Listen, to uh, <laughs> good to see you, because, Nikki. Good to see you, Nikki. Bye, everyone. Yeah. And, and for everybody who, who spent, spent the hour with us, how awesome is that? That you Thank you. Link in with us. We have some exciting new news coming up. So we'd love to share event tips with you. Um, connect with us. I was just double checking. There are no typos. I think everything's right in there. It's our email website and our LinkedIn. Cool. And we'll get uh, over the next day, hopefully not two days, probably usually just one day, we'll get the video processed and uh, we'll get a recording off to everybody that uh, that registered. So um, this is awesome, you guys. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for having us, that. Charlie. This yeah, thank you. Oh my gosh, of course. Um, we should do it again soon. And I'm, I promise to get back to the LinkedIn Live stuff I was doing. So if you'd come on that with me, that'd be great too. Love to. Always a good time hanging out with our friend Charlie. <laughs> we have to update our mustaches though. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> I know. Sorry, I shaved <laughs> recently. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys i will see you very thank soon you. We'll get thank to you everybody who showed up everybody that was here thanks again for taking time out of your day we appreciate it thank you yeah